Well, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Nice to be in uh, Andover, England. <laughs> nice to be here. Nice to be here. Before we get started, I, I'd just like to kneel down and pray and um, mm -hmm. ask the Holy Spirit to come. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for your abundant mercies on our behalf. We thank you for your grace that's still sufficient to meet our need. We thank you that you see us, that you know us, and you come to dwell with us each and every day. Father, we're thankful for your promises tonight that you will not leave us comfortless, that you will come to us and you will guide us as we study together. We pray and thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, I've been going back through the book of Matthew, and I'd like to start there this evening with some things that are just, they're just wrong. They, they just don't make sense. Just don't make sense. Uh, Matthew chapter 1, just to start off. We're looking at the lineage, the royal lineage of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And verse 3 of Matthew chapter 1, it says, In Judas, or Judah, Jacob's son, begot Perez and Zerah of Tamar. Well, I wrote there in my Bible, I said, that's wrong. Mm -hmm. See, Tamar, who was Tamar? Do you remember what, what she was? Does anybody remember who Tamar was? Don't remember? Well, Tamar was that, that lady who was a prostitute, and Judah had left home. And Judah went in and had two sons by her. Now how is it that this woman, this Tamar, a prostitute, could be part of the royal bloodline of Jesus Christ? How can that be, folks? Well, that tells us what Christ is willing to do for each one of us. Go down to verse 5. Notice this. It says, And Solomon begot Boaz of Rahab. Now, who was Rahab? That's a prostitute. She was a prostitute. In what town was she a prostitute? Jericho. In Jericho. That's right. She was a prostitute in Jericho. So that woman had three strikes against her. Number one, she was a woman. In a time and in a place when women were considered to be second-class citizens. Okay? Number two... She was a heathen woman. She was from the, the city of Jericho, so she was a Canaanite woman. And number three, she was a prostitute. So she had three strikes against her. What is she doing in the royal lineage of Jesus Christ? Folks, she's there because the Lord Jesus Christ wrought in her life and changed her life and made her a part of the Israel of God. That's why she's there. Going on down, it says, And Boaz begot Obed of who? Of Ruth. What's Ruth doing there? Ruth was a woman. Ruth was a, a Moabite. So she was a heathen woman. Again, folk, we see the magnificent grace of God that could bring these women into connection with the God of Israel and his transforming power. And then, of course, in verse 6, it says, Jesse begot David the king, and David the king begot Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah. Well, there's another woman with a... had some problems. Had some problems. Got involved with a married man. She was a married woman. So she was involved in an adulterous relationship. What is she doing in the royal bloodline of Christ, folks? Again, we see the magnificent grace of God. That he can take human beings dead in trespasses and sins 
and can change them. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. Now, go on over. We're going to skip chapter 2. We won't look at that, uh, at least not right now. But I want you to notice chapter 3. There's some wrong things here in chapter 3 as well. There's some wrong things here. It says, in those days came John the Baptist. Now, who was John the son of? What was the name of his dad? What was his name? Now, did you guys think you were going to come here this evening and not have to think? No, no, <laughs> did you? I know you too well. <laughs> you know me too well, Mick. Come on now. <laughs> Zacharias. Zacharias. I, and what was, say, tell me your name again. Tucker. 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 Who was his mother? Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Now, his dad, Zacharias, what did he do for a job? What was his job? He was a priest. He was a priest. He was a priest in the ancient Seventh-day Adventist church, wasn't he? Because the ancient Jews were Seventh-day Adventists. So Zacharias was a high official in the Seventh-day Adventist church in the first century. And so now here comes his boy preaching. Now, verse 1 says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the temple in Jerusalem. Now, that's what your Bible says, isn't it? No. That's what mine says. And that's wrong. Why, why was John, the son of a high-ranking official in ancient Adventism, why wasn't he preaching in the temple? Why wasn't he in Jerusalem preaching to the multitudes in the temple? Why, folks? He was in the wilderness of Judea. Why was he there? That doesn't make sense. That's wrong. It, it can't say that, folks. Because John should have been preaching in the temple. Why wasn't he? Because he was not allowed to preach in the temple. Because John's message was straight to the point and the brethren in ancient Adventism said, no, Amen. you are not going to preach in the, in the synagogue. You're not going to preach in the temple. John, he, the only place he could preach was in the wilderness, folks. It's the only place he could preach. Going on down. Verse 5 says, Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan. So the Adventist denomination, they started going out to hear what John was saying because they weren't hearing truth in the church. Mm -hmm. So they went out and listened to this man dressed in these strange clothes. Mm -hmm. And notice verse 6. It says, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Now that's wrong, folks. <laughs> Who gave John the authority to baptize? He wasn't in the denomination. He wasn't ordained by the denomination. What was he doing? Baptizing people. That's wrong. John shouldn't have been doing that, should he? John was ordained not by the brethren. John was ordained by the God of heaven. Mm -hmm. He had a higher calling, folks. Mm -hmm. So we need to analyze some of these things in the books of the Gospels because this tells, the Gospels tell us how Seventh-day Adventists treated the prophet and treated the Son of God himself. There are so many things in these chapters, and we're going to be looking at them through the week, that are just not right. They're just not right. It just doesn't make sense in light of today. It, it shouldn't be that way. But uh, John was baptizing. John had every right to baptize. One other thing I want you to notice here, and we'll, then we'll get into our PowerPoint program this evening. Matthew chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. I want you to notice, it says, When the tempter came to him, 
He, the tempter, said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. So Christ was tempted. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Mm -hmm. Now, folks, is, is, that, is that right or is that wrong? Now, think about that. The devil tempted Christ, and what did Jesus say to meet the temptation? What did he say? Maria, come on. It is written. And when Christ quoted scripture, there was power in that word to resist that temptation. Mm -hmm. Now, folks, do you know what that means? If we claim the word of God, if we claim God's promise, does that mean we too can resist temptation? Mm -hmm. yes. That we can overcome sin? Mm -hmm. That's what it means, folks. Yeah. That's what it means. And Christ showed us that throughout his wilderness temptations, that the word of God can give us power to obey God's commandments. Now, all of those things we've seen in our world today, our world would say they're wrong. But in truth, folk, they're all right, aren't they? They're all right. God can take whores and prostitutes mm -hmm. and, and heathen and, sec and people who are looked upon by society as second-class people. Christ makes them a part of his royal bloodline. That we are a holy nation, kings and priests to God. Isn't that awesome what God can still do for us today? Well, let's take a look this evening. All we've heard about in the 20th and now into the 21st century is about war. War, as Christ said in Matthew chapter 24, you will hear of war and rumors of war. And of course, that's all we hear about. Well, we read in Great Controversy, page 565 and 566. Notice, especially the red, but it says, Romanism as a system is no more in harmony with the gospel of Christ now than in any former period in our history. The Protestant churches are in great darkness, so they would discern the signs of the times. The Roman church is far reaching in her plans and modes of operation. She's employing every device to extend her influence and increase her power in preparation for a fierce and determined conflict to regain control of the world. To reestablish persecution and to undo all that Protestantism has done. Catholicism is gaining ground on every side. How many sides? A, self, a few sides? Every. How many is every? Oh. Everywhere. Every. In the media, in the, on the TV, in the newspapers, on the radio. Mm -hmm. Everywhere, in government, in economics, in politics, Rome is gaining ground. Every side. Schools, in schooling, in the medical professions. Yes. Every side, folks. Every side. But it says she is far reaching in her plans and modes of operation. Mm -hmm. The Jesuit order that is standing behind the former Pope, Benedict XVI, mm -hmm. the Jesuit order plans things years, decades, even centuries ahead in order to bring their plans to fruition. Mm -hmm. They want to undo all that Protestantism has done. Is it happening today? Well, you know, back in 1871, that's 129, that's 142 years ago, a man stated there would be three wars in this world. Three wars, folks. Notice what it says. The man's name was Albert Pike. Albert Pike was the sovereign grand commander of the ancient and accepted Scottish rite of Freemasonry and the top Illuminist in America. Now, folks, because of 
the understanding that we have of the Illuminati. The Illuminati was begun by a Jesuit named Adam Weishaupt. And the principles of Illuminism are the principles of the Jesuits. So Albert Pike in the 19th century, in 18, the 1870s, he was the top Jesuit in the United States. And Albert Pike wrote a letter to Giuseppe Mazzini in 1871, and he said, we're planning three wars. We're planning three wars. He said the First World War was to be fomented in order to destroy Tsarist Russia and to place that vast land under the direct control of Illuminati agents. Mm -hmm. Well, that's exactly what happened. Exactly what happened. Russia was then to be used as a boogeyman to further the aims of the Illuminati worldwide. We'll notice in a moment how that was fulfilled. World War II was to be fomented through manipulation of the differences that existed between German nationalists and political Zionists. Those who are pro-Israel, pro-Jew. And that, of course, would include the United States mm -hmm. and this great land that we're in tonight. Mm -hmm. It includes Great Britain. Mm -hmm. Great Britain is pro-Jew. That's what they are. So they're political Zionists. This was to result in an expansion of Russian influence and the establishment of a state of Israel and Palestine. So that was going to happen after the Second World War. Russia's influence would expand and a state of Israel would be set up in Palestine. Mm -hmm. Now there'd be a Third World War. The Third World War was planned to result from differences stirred up by Jesuit agents, Illuminati Jesuit agents, between the political Zionists, those who are pro-Jews, and, and the Arab world. Mm -hmm. Have we been watching that happening? Have we been hearing about that in the press, folks? It's already happening. It's already happening, Maria. I saw. You know what, folks? For the last nine months, the United States of America have had three aircraft carrier humongous vessels in the Persian Gulf with aircraft carriers that contain atomic warheads that are ready just to take off and start dropping atomic bombs mm -hmm. on Iran. You realize that? Mm -hmm. And do you know what Iran wants to do? They want to start dropping bombs on Israel. The Illuminati, this conflict was planned to spread worldwide. The Jesuits planned to unleash the nihilists and atheists and provoke a formidable social cataclysm, which in all its horror will show clearly to the nations the effect of absolute atheism, origin of savagery, and of the most bloody turmoil. Then it says, in the context of this third battle, it says that civilization would be ready to receive the true light through the universal manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer, brought finally out in the public view. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to analyze this letter this evening. We're going to analyze those wars. We're going to analyze this pure doctrine of Lucifer. What is that? What is that? What's just ahead? Now, isn't he a handsome fellow? Just the kind of guy that you'd want your daughter to date. I mean, Belinda, wouldn't you be thrilled if Panasha brought home this guy and said, Mama, I'm gonna, this is my date. Wouldn't you be proud? You'd be sick, wouldn't you? <laughs> That's Albert Pike. The top Jesuit in the United States who wrote that letter. He was the sovereign grand commander of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, the top Illuminist, the top Jesuit in the United States in the 19th century. By the time of Albert Pike, the Freemasons were completely taken over by the Jesuits. The Illuminati had always been a Jesuit front. Thus, Albert Pike worked in the inner circles of the Jesuit order and knew what was being planned. Mm -hmm. So these 
incredibly powerful people in this world were planning on war. Planning on war. Now what happens, folks? What happens when people go to war? What happens? They kill each other. They maim each other. People come back from the, from, you know, uh, from the uh, war in the Gulf. People come back to America and they can't work for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. They die at 50 years old. They have no existence. War destroys people. Like in Angola, no. What's that, Maria? Angola. A lot of disabled because of that as well. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Any war, whenever and wherever it's been fought, it disables, yeah. it destroys people. That's what this man, that's what the Jesuit order, that's what the Illuminati, that's what the Masons, that's what they're all about, is creating war. And that's what the carnal heart, that's all the carnal heart can produce. Anger, hatred, war. Separate families. Separate families, Marie. Absolutely. Destroy homes. Folks, I'm so thankful tonight that we have a choice to make. Because Jesus Christ went to Calvary's cross, we don't have to be enslaved to these kind of people. We don't have to be under the control of this evil system. We can be under the control of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You know, folks, when people take power and authority, people use it in different ways. Albert Pike uses his wealth, he used his wealth and power to destroy, just like his father the devil. Mm -hmm. But Jesus Christ used his power to bless people, to uplift people, to strengthen and heal and restore people. You know, in Isaiah chapter 61, we read the beautiful promise of the Redeemer in Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 3. These were the words that Christ quoted when he preached in the synagogue in Nazareth. Notice Isaiah 61 and verse 1. The Bible says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, mm -hmm. to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Mm -hmm. See, Christ didn't use his power to hurt, mm -hmm. to maim, to destroy. Christ used his power to heal broken hearts, to set those to freedom who were held captive by sin. Verse 3. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give to them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Mm -hmm. I am so thankful tonight, folks, that we can put our lives, we can submit ourselves to the power and authority of Jesus Christ and allow him to mend our broken heart, to set us free from the bondage of wrong. I'm so thankful tonight for his lordship and the fact that he does not abuse his power and authority but he uses it to restore people. Not like these animals. I'm sorry to say, but that's what this man was. The Jesuit order. White animals, absolutely. The Pope himself, the Jesuit order. These people are animals, folks. Yeah. This is what they are, they're animals. They want to destroy humanity. They, they create wars and bloodshed and broken homes and broken dreams and destroying of economies. Mm -hmm. But Christ came to use his power to uplift and to heal and restore. And praise God, we can give our lives to his hands tonight 
and allow Him to guide us day by day. This is Giuseppe Mazzini, who Albert Pike wrote the letter to. Now just to give you a little idea, when the letter was written, Ulysses S. Grant was the President of the United States. In the English realm, who was the Queen of, of England in 1871? Victoria. Victoria. Queen Victoria, that's right. In America, the Civil War had just ended. James White would die nine years later. The early Seventh-day Adventist Church had not yet sent out its first foreign missionary. James Andrews was going to leave to go to Europe in 1874. The final spike had just been nailed down to complete the first transcontinental railroad. So that's what was going on in 1871. All of those things, folks, were going on when Albert Pike said, we've got three wars that we're planning to destroy in the 20 and 21st centuries. The Jesuit order had planned the wars of the 20th century and the current war going on in the Middle East. We've been lied to, folks. The mass media of today, it's a lie. It wasn't the shooting of the Archduke of Austria that brought World War I. It wasn't Adolf Hitler and Mussolini that brought World War II. It wasn't weapons of mass destruction of Saddam Hussein that brought this current war on terror. These wars were on the Jesuit chalkboard over 130 years ago. To them and to them alone is the responsibility for these horrors. These people were simply puppets. Saddam Hussein was a puppet. Mussolini and Hitler were puppets. The visible leaders that are paraded before the world are mere puppets whose strings are being pulled by their masters. Mm -hmm. Now Albert Pike said that the First World War was to be fomented in order to destroy Tsarist Russia mm -hmm. and to put that land under the direct control of Jesuit agents. Russia was then to be used as a boogeyman to further the aims of the Jesuits or Illuminati worldwide. And that's exactly what Russia became. It became a devouring tiger. First under Nikolai Lenin, and then under Joseph Stalin. And millions and millions of people in Russia were killed. Just, just killed. Hunger. By hunger, yes. Yeah. And it was all planned. Yeah. It was all planned, Marie. All planned. Was the Tsarist system destroyed in Russia during World War I? Albert Pike said it was. Yeah, well, was that's what right. They were looking for Anastasia. Yeah. yeah. They found everybody, all bodies, but Anastasia was the end. I think they found after that body. They were looking for. I'll tell you, Maria, I have, I have a real question in my mind as to the, all the hoopla about Anastasia, mm -hmm. one of Nicholas II's daughters, because what happened was July 16 to 17, July of 1918, right as World War I was coming to an end, the last Tsar of Russia, Nicholas II, his wife, Alexandria, and all of their children, they had one, two, three, four girls and one boy who was a hemophiliac. Mm -hmm. They were brought into a room and they were all killed. I, I believe they were all killed. I believe they were. But folk, it was this death of the Tsar that brought an end to the Tsarist system in Russia right at the end of World War I. The reason the Tsarist system was destroyed was because previous czars, Alexander, in 1816, had expelled the Jesuit order from St. Petersburg and Moscow. And then in 1820, he excluded them entirely from Russian soil. 
That's taken from Richard Thompson's book, The Footprints of the Jesuits, page 245 and 246. Another Alexander, another Tsar in Russia, had attached his signature to a constitution to be adopted by Russia. This same Tsar, at the height of the Civil War, came to the aid of Abraham Lincoln and sent the Russian fleet to blockade, to blockade the shores of the United States so that the European powers could not give aid to the South. So the Tsarist system in Russia had to go, had to go. Folks, I want you to notice something in light of today. One of the things that Rome hated about Alexander II was he was going to write a constitution guaranteeing freedoms mm -hmm. for the Russian people. You see, there's two kinds of leaders in the world. There are leaders that seek to uphold constitutional freedom, civil and religious liberty. Mm -hmm. Those leaders, folk, are following the dictates and the principles of the God of heaven. But when you have a leader, any leader of any country that seeks to destroy civil and religious liberty, you have a political leader that is working for the Catholic Church. And the Serbians want to... What's that? Our, yeah, the group who wants our liberty. They want to destroy them as well because they are in a stone in their shoes. Absolutely. That's right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So you see today, like what's going on in America with Barack Obama, and now this, this man that's somewhere over in Russia, Eric Snowden. Edward. Edward Snowden. This man, folk, has sought to blow the whistle on the National Security Agency, who is trying to take away civil freedom in America, which Barack Obama completely supports. And so did previous presidents support it. Barack Obama, as have many American presidents, they are working for Rome. And they're seeking to destroy civil and religious liberty. What's that? Abraham Lincoln opposed to create a central bank. He was against. Absolutely. Was a good president. Absolutely. And the killing was a Jesuit as well. Absolutely, Marie. Absolutely. Mick, did you have a question? Yeah, yes. Well, I've got some which I'll keep till after, but this President Obama, he's a traitor. <coughs> so many British troops have been slaughtered in, in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know some of them. Some of the ones that survived have had in my camp. And I said to my wife, I said, I find it absolutely disgusting. Those soldiers, they're only doing as they're told. They've laid down their lives, they've had their heads chopped off. Mm -hmm. 2,000 American soldiers have died in Afghanistan. And now on, on the BBC News, very recently, Obama is now holding peace talks with the self-same Taliban. What sort of situation is that? That's like holding peace talks with the devil. They have to reduce the population anyway. It only is done, Mick, and it's been happening like that for, for centuries. It is only done like that, Mick. You, cre you create an enemy, you attack them, you get what you want, and then you unite with them to go after somebody else. In the 1980s, Mick, the United States supported Iraq in their war with Iran. You see? And then after a little while, you get what you want with Iraq, and then you turn on them, and now they become your enemy. And it just goes on and on and on. And they kill for one purpose, and you know. If you read stones in Georgia, the last one, they want to reduce the population, and they find out the way to kill all of them. Absolutely, really. Yeah. Absolutely. It's true. I'm so thankful tonight. I'm, you know, as, as we look at these men, as they use their power to destroy mm -hmm. I'm so thankful we have a choice. I'm so thankful we can surrender our lives to Christ. Amen. Because he will use his power to restore. And he will use us to help restore others. 
and to help others. Amen. So, praise God, we have a choice as we see these terrible men do these terrible things to humanity. By driving the Jesuits from Russia, refusing to establish a central bank, planning a constitution, aiding the North during the Civil War, the Tsars of Russia had incurred the undying wrath of the Jesuit order. Payback was imminent. The other no-no of the Tsars was their protection of the Russian Orthodox Church, the implacable enemy of Rome for over a thousand years. So that's why Albert Pike predicted the Tsarist system, we are planning to destroy it. Because it's done these things. It's refused to have a central bank in Russia. It's planning a constitution. It's helping our enemies, you know, Lincoln in the United States, that was why the Tsarist system had to go. And the Tsarist system supported the Russian Orthodox Church. World War II. Now see, when we think and we read in, in our school books, our history books, we're told about how bad this guy was. Well, folks, World War II was fomented through manipulation. Manipulation of the differences that existed between Germans, the German nationalists, and political Zionists, those that were pro-Jew. Now, because of that war that was manipulated by the Jesuit order, mm -hmm. this would result in an expansion of Russian influence and the establishment of a state of Israel and Palestine. Mm -hmm. Well, did that happen after World War II? Did Russian influence expand? Well, Russian influence went all over the world. Mm -hmm. It went to Africa. It went to Southeast Asia. It went to the Caribbean, to Cuba. It went to South America. It went into Europe as well. Mm -hmm. So Russian influence expanded throughout the world. Was the state of Israel established in Palestine? Right after World War II. Albert Pike's been right twice. Does that mean he's a prophet? No. They plan it. They plan things in advance so that when the time is ripe and the time comes, mm -hmm. then they carry it out. He's not a prophet. This was the man who pulled the strings during World War I and World War II. He was the superior general of the Jesuit order. His name was Legachowski. This man carried out Albert Pike's plans to restore the papacy to world dominion. He had Nicholas II killed. He was behind the Holocaust. He triggered World War II. He planned the deaths of millions. So here we have this group of people planning the annihilation of, human, of humanity. And it's going on today. Going on today, the plan for World War II was the expansion of Russia and establishing, establishing a state for Jews in Palestine. Did that happen? Mm -hmm. Following World War II, we find Russia influence expanding to Eastern Europe, Southeast Asia, even to the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Albert Pike's batting a thousand. And of course, right after World War II, in 1948, the area right here along the Mediterranean Sea, this little strip of land was set up for the nation of Israel. That's exactly what Albert Pike said was being planned by Rome. Now why? Why was that state established for the Jews right there? What has happened from the very get-go when Israel was established and many Jews returned to that area of the world. What's happened? What's been the result of Albert Pike and his plan? What's been the result? Well, Israel has had wars with Egypt. They've had wars with Jordan. They've had wars with Syria. 
They've had wars with Lebanon. And they've had wars with Iraq and Iran over here. With the entire Arab world, they've gone to battle with Israel. So why did the papacy want Israel and the Jews established there? Put well, in the man, no? You want to move there to, to do his kingdom? No? No. What they did was the Vatican believed the Jews believe that their Messiah is going to come and set up a thousand years of peace. Well, the papacy doesn't like that idea because if, if the Jews' Messiah comes and sets up his thousand years of peace, then the Catholic Church can't rule. Mm -hmm. But the Catholic Church says, if we can destroy as many Jews as possible, Jesus then the Jewish Christ will yeah. not come. And so then the Catholic Church can take over the world. Yeah, no. That is why, folk, we continually see Jews being killed in our world today. It's for that very reason. That's what uh, Avril Manhattan said in his book, The Vatican-Moscow-Washington Alliance. He said this, The specter of the creation of such a theocracy by the Jews has haunted the inner chambers of the Catholic Church from her earliest inception and still is a dominant fear. In Vatican eyes, the millenarian yearning for a global Hebrew theocracy represents a deadly threat to the eschatal, the end time teachings of the Catholic Church. When translated into concrete political terms, such a view spells not only rivalry, but implacable enmity. And that's taken from Avril Manhattan's book, The Vatican Moscow Washington Alliance. <coughs> The folk? What's that, Marie? He was the president of Iran. Not now. He, not now. He just was removed with a recent election. Yes. Yes, yes he was. The folk, Albert Pike was right on World War I and he was right on World War II. And he said there'd be one more war. One more. That, that man was very against Israel, always was nice. See, see Marie? He the other one from South America, Chavez. Yes. He had very close friends. The one in Venezuela. Against Israel. Absolutely. I saw. See Marie, this man's a puppet. Just like him. Hitler was a puppet, mm -hmm. just like Mussolini was a puppet, like all the rest of these leaders. He's working for Rome. They use them and after they get rid of them. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. That's exactly right. See, the Third World War, the Third War is going to result from differences stirred up by Illuminati agents, Jesuit agents, between those who are pro-Israel and the Arab world. The conflict would spread worldwide. So, folk, there is going on today in our world, we constantly are seeing agitation. Right now, the United States is thinking about attacking Syria because they have used uh, weapons of mass destruction on their own people. Mm -hmm. Well, if America invades Syria, what would happen? Well, it's real easy, folk. If America invades Syria, then Iran will come to Syria's aid. And if Iran comes to Syria's aid, then who will join with the United States? Israel. Israel. Yeah. Israel. And if that happens, Russia will then come to the aid of Syria and Iran. And then England will come to the aid of America and Israel. And the conflict folk will spread worldwide. That's what Albert Pike said would happen. Because you see, that's what happens. Alliances are formed. If America goes to war in the Middle East, Israel helps them. England helps them. If Syria goes to war, if Iran goes to war, Russia helps them. You see? And so Albert Pike said that these, the Jesuits 
are planning this war and they're stirring it up. They're stirring the pot until this war. Against each other and same time help each other. That's right, Marie. Absolutely. See, there's a purpose for it. There's a purpose. And it's something that a famous German philosopher named George Friedrich Hegel once said. He said, if you want a desired result, if you want a solution, then what you do is you have to create conflict. Mm -hmm. And if you create one against another, you have two powers. You have them fight against each other. And in the background, you know what you eventually want to have happen. But you let these two powers fight it out. And then when it gets bad enough, then you come forward and you say, I've got the answer. Here is the solution to the problems in our world. Now, notice, notice what Albert Pike said. It's right out of Hegel's book on thesis, antithesis, and solution. He says this, there would be a conflict, it would spread all over the world, and when it does, the people of the world will receive the true light through the universal manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer brought finally out in the public view. So when this war erupts folk and it gets bad enough, the devil then will come forward, the Jesuits, the apostate Protestants, they will come forward with the solution and they'll say, this is the answer. This is the pure doctrine of Lucifer. What is the pure doctrine of Lucifer? Any idea? Sun worship. It's sun worship. That's right, do the sun. It's sun worship, folks. You see, folks, before, before the devil personates Christ, there has to be a false Armageddon. This will be a false Armageddon. This war that's taking place, it's going to erupt in the Middle East. Right there. It's going to erupt right in this area. And all the world will become involved. It will then be decreed and called a false Armageddon. The manifestation of the true light will come into play, the pure doctrine of Lucifer. The devil will impersonate Christ. As great controversy 624 says, as the crowning act of the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. There's your pure doctrine of Lucifer, folks. In the light of this war that's gurgling and rumbling beneath the, you know, behind the scenes, but it's coming more and more into focus. This is on the horizon. The Sunday law is on the horizon, folks. The pure doctrine of Lucifer. Mm -hmm. And in the midst of this Sunday law crisis, in the midst of this false Armageddon, all the world will then have a chance to make a final decision for Christ or against Him. And then, folk, Revelation 22 says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. See, folk, God is going to allow everybody in the midst of these cataclysmic events, in the midst of war, in the midst of this false Armageddon, God is going to allow everybody to make a final, eternal decision. And everybody is making, rapidly making strong decisions for Christ or against Him. Today, we all are. We all are. Albert Pike Leading Jesuit in the 19th century said there were three wars. In the final war, which is being agitated in the press right now between Jews and Arabs, 
Lucifer's pure doctrine would be seen. I believe it's Sunday worship, folk. There will be a false Armageddon before the devil impersonates Christ. This third war will be it. And in this third war, we will see Sunday. After the loud cry, the devil will appear claiming to be Christ. I'm so thankful, folk, again. And I want to close with this this evening in Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, as we read about the plans of Rome for this world, as we see how they have been fulfilled in the 20th and right into the 21st century, we are told in Revelation 3, Verses 10 and 11. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Folk, hold on to your crown. Hold on to your crown. Christ is coming. The earth's final events are coming rapidly upon us. Hold on to your crown and don't let anybody take it away from you because Christ is coming. I'm so grateful tonight to the Lord Jesus Christ that he has used his power to restore each one of us. And that he still uses that power for that reason today. While men war, while men engage in battle and bloodshed, Christ is involved in healing and in restoring broken hearts and broken lives. I'm thankful we can submit our lives to his lordship this evening. Let us pray in close. Father in heaven, thank you so much. Thank you so much for Jesus tonight that because of his willingness to step down from the power source of the universe and to come into this world to use his power to heal and restore. Thank you that we have hope, courage, strength tonight. Thank you so much that Jesus used his power to uplift and to build. Father in heaven, as we have analyzed the workings of the carnal heart, of the devil himself, of his minions, the Jesuit order, of Albert Pike and his puppets, we're thankful tonight that the final battles of this world's history are in your hands. And I'm thankful tonight that we can put our lives into your hands as well. Father, we give our lives to you this evening. We ask that your gracious power, your wonderful authority, would take control of every thought, every action, and use us to be a blessing in this fallen and dying world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. was a heathen woman again folk we see the magnificent grace of God that could bring these women into connection with the God of Israel and his transforming power and then of course in verse 6 it says Jesse begot David the king and David the king begot Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah well there's another woman with a had some problems, had some problems, got involved with a married man. She was a married woman. So she was involved in an adulterous relationship. What is she doing in the royal bloodline of Christ, folks? Again, we see the magnificent grace of God, that he can take human beings dead in trespasses and sins and can change them. Beautiful, beautiful. Now, go on over.
We're going to skip chapter 2. We won't look at that, uh, at least not right now. But I want you to notice chapter 3. There's some wrong things here in chapter 3 as well. There's some wrong things here. It says, in those days came John the Baptist. Now, who was John the son of? What was the name of his dad? What was his name? Now, did you guys think you were going to come here this evening and not have to think? Yeah, no, <laughs> did you? I know you too well. <laughs> you know me too well, Mick. Come on now. <laughs> Zacharias. Yeah. Zacharias. I, and what was, say, tell me your name again. Taka. 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 Taco, who was his mother? Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Now his dad, Zacharias, what did he do for a job? What was his job? He was a priest. He was a priest. He was a priest in the ancient Seventh-day Adventist church. Wasn't he? Truth in the church. Mm -hmm. So they went out and listened to this man dressed in these strange clothes. Mm -hmm. And notice verse 6. It says, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Now that's wrong, folks. Who gave John the authority to baptize? He wasn't in the denomination. He wasn't ordained by the denomination. What was he doing? Baptizing people. That's wrong. John shouldn't have been doing that, should he? John was ordained not by the brethren. John was ordained by the God of heaven. Mm -hmm. He had a higher calling, folks. Mm -hmm. So we need to analyze some of these things in the books of the Gospels because this tells, the Gospels tell us how Seventh-day Adventists treated the prophet and treated the Son of God himself. There are so many things in these chapters, and we're going to be looking at them through the week, that are just not right. They're just not right. It just doesn't make sense in light of today. It, it shouldn't be that way. But uh, John was baptizing. John had every right to baptize. One other thing I want you to notice here, and we'll, then we'll get into our PowerPoint program this evening. Matthew chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. I want you to notice, it says, When the tempter came to him, he, the tempter, said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. So Christ was tempted. But he answered and said, It is written, man. See, Tamar, who was Tamar? Do you remember what, what she was? Does anybody remember who Tamar was? Don't remember? Well, Tamar was the, that lady who was a prostitute. And Judah had left home. And Judah went in and had two sons by her. Now, how is it that this woman, this Tamar, a prostitute, could be part of the royal bloodline of Jesus Christ. How can that be, folks? Well, that tells us what Christ is willing to do for each one of us. Go down to verse 5. Notice this. It says, And Solomon begot Boaz of Rahab. Now, who was Rahab? It's a prostitute. She was a prostitute. In what town was she a prostitute? Jericho. In Jericho. That's right. She was a prostitute in Jericho. So that woman had three strikes against her. Number one, she was a woman. In a time and in a place when women were considered to be second-class citizens. Okay? Number two, she was a heathen woman. She was from the, the city of Jericho, so she was a Canaanite woman. And number three, she was a prostitute. So she had three strikes against her. What is she doing in the royal lineage of Jesus Christ? Folks, she's there because the Lord Jesus Christ wrought in her life and changed her life mm -hmm. and made her a part of the Israel of God. That's why she's there. Going on down, it says, And Boaz begot Obed of who? 
of Ruth. What's Ruth doing there? Ruth was a woman. Ruth was a, a Moabite, so she... Well, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Nice to be in uh, Andover, England. <laughs> nice to be here. Nice to be here. Before we get started, I, I'd just like to kneel down and pray and um, mm -hmm. ask the Holy Spirit to come. Dear Father in Heaven, we thank You for Your abundant mercies on our behalf. We thank You for Your grace that's still sufficient to meet our need. We thank You that You see us, that You know us, and You come to dwell with us each and every day. Father, we're thankful for Your promises tonight that You will not leave us comfortless, that You will come to us and you will guide us as we study together. We pray and thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, I've been going back through the book of Matthew, and I'd like to start there this evening with some things that are just, they're just wrong. They, they just don't make sense. Just don't make sense. Uh, Matthew chapter 1, just to start off. We're looking at the lineage, the royal lineage of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And verse 3 of Matthew chapter 1, it says, In Judas, or Judah, Jacob's son, begot Perez and Zerah of Tamar. Well, I wrote there in my Bible, I said, that's wrong. Because the ancient Jews were Seventh-day Adventists. So Zacharias was a high official in the Seventh-day Adventist church in the first century. And so now here comes his boy preaching. Now, verse 1 says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the temple in Jerusalem. Now, that's what your Bible says, isn't it? No. That's what mine says. And that's why. Why, why was John, the son of a high-ranking official in ancient Adventism, why wasn't he preaching in the temple? Why wasn't he in Jerusalem preaching to the multitudes in the temple? Why, folks? He was in the wilderness of Judea. Why was he there? That doesn't make sense. That's wrong. It, it can't say that, folks. Because John should have been preaching in the temple. Why wasn't he? Because he was not allowed to preach in the temple. Because John's message was straight to the point and the brethren in ancient Adventism said, no, Amen. you are not going to preach in the, in the synagogue. You're not going to preach in the temple. John, he, the only place he could preach was in the wilderness, folk. It's the only place he could preach. Going on down. Verse 5 says, Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan. So the Adventist denomination, they started going out to hear what John was saying because they weren't hearing.